So in this video, I just want to do a little thing on some of the change that has occurred uh, well in my GS career, and so that we're aware that some of the stuff we're working on today will change in the future. So I call this the uh, change arc, and this is specifically for uh, GIS, especially ESRI products. You can apply this to almost any kind of uh, area, sector, even life if you want to. Um, so what I want to do is uh, start over here and just a little bit of a legend. Uh, and they have, so light green means uh, an application, uh, a darker green library, uh, a blue data source is from ESRI, uh, so it either what we traditionally see as data, or maybe the new thing, the resource, which eventually has data in it. And there's also external formats that have popped up that ESRI is supporting as well. Lots of different relationships. Some products spawned others. Some products were, were replaced in that. Some There were definitely some inspirations along the way, and we'll talk about those. Sometimes uh, in order to make one resource or type of data, we have to combine things. And often something is used to build, libraries are often used to build uh, typical applications. And I also have tagged uh, some things as dead walkers and some things as walkers, which means they're, they're still in use, but they're uh, nearing their end. And there's still a group symbol just to group things together in that. So this is a little bit to go over the legend so that we can sort of follow along. So I'm gonna start probably what, uh, Arcutho 6.7 uh, version. Uh, of the product. So it was called ArcInfo at the time. Uh, a lot of it was done with command line without any, out any kind of GUI. Uh, there weren't really buttons that you clicked on that had events or drop down lists. There were some uh, GUI looking products, but they were more like a, a visualization uh, of data, right? So they were little windows that would drop some data so you can kind of see what you were doing if you needed to. Those were ArcEdit and ArcPlot. Arc edit for editing, arc plot for making layouts. So we can, I think, effectively say that product's not in use anymore and that it's dead. A big thing about Arc Info were coverages or, or workspaces with coverages in them. Often you have something called a workspace, workspace which was a directory. There were uh, other directories underneath called coverages and a shared info directory where all the attributes went. Now, coverages are, use, are used to build a product called. Uh, or data product, we'll say, called librarian. So if you want to do all the contours for BC at 120,000, hard to put it in one coverage. You break it up or tile it across multiple directories uh, as coverages, but then also have an index coverage that told you where everything was uh, and that. And so that a librarian is just a, uh, a massive directory of workspaces and inside their coverages they, to give you the ability to have a seamless data set, we'll say. Uh, ArcStorm uh, was an improvement to a librarian. So librarian is very aware of path names. And ArcStorm was trying to try to take librarian to a true client server sort of uh, model where you didn't need to do NFS mounts or anything like that. Uh, you did, or you didn't have to be aware where the data was actually stored on disk. You just went to the service part and say, could I have the trim contours, please, in that. But all these products are gone. But library did actually in, uh, 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 inspire, uh, I would say, vector tiles that we see in use today. Uh, librarian was very flexible. Uh, you could break up on any type of polygon coverage. It could be rectangular polygon cells, or it could be uh, even watershed boundaries in that. in that. So a new product did come along, uh, quite a few after Arc Info. Uh, there was on the scene for quite some time, Arc View, up to 3.x in that. But when Arc View sort of landed, it's a full-fledged GUI, so there's buttons and menus and toolbars, very different than Arc Edit or Arc Plot. Uh, and multiple layouts, multiple themes. Uh, we built a whole thing called the Goat Theme Manager around Arc View and just trying to find enterprise data in a warehouse to make it easy for end users. At the same uh, time, uh, you could build sort of custom extensions in, in ArcView. Some people wanted to do maybe more focused apps that we see today. And uh, a library popped up called Map Objects. Again, this is all the ESRI technology. And people were using Map Objects and typically VB, uh, Visual Basic, to build you know smaller 
lighter weight GIS applications. So that's a phrase that you heard at the time, put a map in your app. That's sort of where it started with Arc Objects. We'll pop back up to Shapefiles and SD in a second. We're going to go down below. Those two products spawned uh, two internet map servers. So there was an ArcView internet map server and a Map Objects internet map server. And so they had two products, uh, software products running at the same time, doing very similar uh, functionality. Uh, there is trend, if you want my opinion, that they don't desire that. So they like to have one code base uh, for that type of product. Having two products competing, uh, you know, it just, uh, they have a tendency to collapse those over time, and that's what they did. So those two products, ArcView IMS and MapObjects IMS, got replaced by something called ArcIMS, and it made it all the way to version 4, okay? But you may not have heard of it, right? That sort of thing. So uh, ArcIMS did replace that. It was, uh, you know, combining those products into one. ArcIMS is definitely uh, sort of a Java servlet uh Type of application so you run it inside something like tomcat or classfish or another type of servlet container and i again it lasted for quite a while in that but as you can see you know it's marked as a dead walker so it too got replaced i was going to jump up top here uh shape files again an e3i thing definitely when you work with shape files you know there's three there's the SHP file that has geometry. There's the DBF file that has the attributes. And there's an SHX file, which is an index file, not spatial. So you can quickly look up, uh, if you're on feature, if you're interested in feature 54, where it is that, where does that start in, in the SHP file? And where does it start in the DBF file? So you can quickly read in the information without reading the whole file. So that concept of three files in a coincident, uh, non, we'll say it, non, uh, arc no topology so where you have redundant uh, data by, when you have two adjacent lots uh, I mean that's what happened with shape files there is no topology built in to the base format and neither is SDE but SDE was the first attempt uh, one of their first attempts uh, to get spatial data into the database so SDE is the ability to store uh, points, lines, polygons, started out just as vector uh, in the database. And so, and that was a product built outside of, outside of ESRI in that. But it, it follows a very uh, similar model. For every layer in SDE, there's three tables. There's one with geometry, like the SHP. There's one called, and that's called the F table. And there's the business table, which has the attributes, like the DBF. And then there's this spatial index file called the S table, right, which is, you know, all the other shape file was an index file, it's an index file. So uh, you can see where uh, it drew a lot of its inspiration and followed that model. Because in a relational database, there's no need to separate any of that stuff out to three different tables in that, two at the most. Uh, one would, you know, because you can combine the business table and the spatial table in the real world today. But definitely inspired. But then all of a sudden, ArcSD pops up. So that's where I bought that product and the person who built it, and I believe they, he still works there. And so you have ArcSDE uh, sort of uh, come online in that. And so they bought it, rebranded it, and started adding more features to it. So uh, part of uh, what happens here is uh, to help people bridge the gap from the coverage world to the ArcSD world, they built another product called ArcSD for coverages. So it's to make your ArcStorm librarian and coverages look like an SDE table in the database. There's another product here as well called the GIO Manager. So when you installed ArcSD on a server, uh, you, ins you installed it alongside a relational database such as Oracle or SQL Server or today PostGIS. But it's an extra piece of software running. And so all the ESRI products uh, ArcInfo at the time, ArcView at the time, uh, could get data out of ArcSDE. But they didn't talk to Oracle, they talked to this GIO manager and on port 5151. And this is how you can tell what product's actually running and, and that. Uh, that eventually got killed off and got replaced with something called DirectConnects. Okay, and DirectConnects uh, happens somewhere in between the multi-user geodatabase and the enterprise-enabled geodatabase. 
Uh, again, those are uh, those procs are definitely spawned from Arc SDE. And today, the Enterprise Enabled Geo Database, there's only three databases that support it, and that would be Oracle, SQL Server, and Postgres SQL. So when you go to make an Enterprise Enabled Geo Database, there's no GIO manager anymore. Uh, and those are the only three databases that appear on the drop down list. Um, part of uh, what showed up, uh, in all honesty, uh, was something called the personal geo database. And you still might find those out there if people are running eight or nine. Okay. So we'll just go down here. Uh, this is RTS Desktop. Now, RTS Desktop uh, and that uh, definitely meant to replace Arc View and Arc Info. Okay. But already I've got it labeled with a walker symbol, right? So it's kind of on its uh, last legs. Uh, one thing about uh, ArcGIS Desktop is that it's built with something called Arc Objects. Now, you could actually code in Arc Objects and build extensions. Uh, you could also build standalone applications. So you can use the same objects that uh, Arc Map and Arc Catalog were using to build your own custom focused application. Those same objects were also used to build ArcGIS Server. So ArcGIS Server is a product you might hear that is in use today. It's gone through a couple iterations, and so it eventually replaces ArcIMS. So ArcIMS, Java Servlet technology, ArcGIS Server still runs inside the Servlet container, but the objects that do all the heavy lifting uh, are done by ArcGIS. So they've had this before where they had objects, you know, in ArcView, for a desktop app and they use the same objects to build an internet map server. So instead of having two code bases again, right, ArcIMS and ArcGIS server, uh, or ArcIMS code versus Arc Objects code, they re rebuilt ArcIMS using Arc Objects uh, libraries to build ArcGIS server. And the first era, 9.10 in around there, ArcGIS server was SOAP XML base. I even had students on uh, in a certain course using Windows 4, mobile 4 or 5, which is before the iPhone was ever released. And we were able to, using the .NET Compact Framework in Visual Studio, build simple mapping apps on a PDA device like an HP 4700 and talk to ArcGIS server uh, with proxy objects. Typically when you use SOAP XML, there's this whole WSDL file proxy object deal that you do to build the apps. Okay, and so, but again, notice it's got one crossbones on the, on the SOAP XML one. What we're looking at today is uh, uh, the SOAP XML version of ArcGIS Server eventually got replaced with the ArcGIS Server REST JSON. So uh, when you go talk to a service today, it talks the language of REST and the data of JSON. There's one little piece that sort of butted off of ArcGIS Server. Uh, it was called the Web ADF, so the Web Application Developers Framework, and it was Java Server Faces Base. No skull crossbones, no longer around. Now this is where you, on the same server, ArcGIS Server, you could SOAP XML, you could build web applications. That ability to drag and drop and build web uh, build up a web application was there, but eventually got killed off probably for HTML5 apps. And Flex and Silverlight help kill it off as well. So we'll take a look at those. We're going to jump up top here and look at more formats. Okay. So we have the uh, personal geodatabase we were on the left. That was an access file. Not very scalable in terms of size and not very scalable in terms of stability. It gets replaced with the file geodatabase. So what you see a lot of today is a lot of file geodatabases. Okay. And you can see a little bit of enterprise enable geo databases if you're in a big organization that has a bigger budget that can afford the you know advanced or enterprise licensing and that's the ability basically to do the file geo database in a relational database such as oracle sql server or postgres sql so those are a couple of big data stores that you can hit as a gs person but today uh with uh arcgis server and if we follow on the bottom here, ArcGIS Server REST JSON does come up, and we use a uh, that's used a lot to create image services and feature services. And there's a little bit of a you know uh, branching or diversity within those two big categories. But that's another place where we can go to get data.
Okay, so we can either go to an image service right away. That's where your base maps come. So if you're in Arc Pro or in Arc Map, using the Eastride base maps, you're getting them from an image service. And you can also go th through your own ArcGIS and server to feature services, or you can go into uh, something like ArcGIS Online, which we'll talk about shortly, to get at features. So I mean, today if we're going to get data and we're Eastride shop, it's going to be probably predominantly file geo database, maybe some web services and possibly the enterprise enabled geo database if we're a bigger company. Uh, other formats that aren't ESRIs that the tools can actually uh, use, uh, vector tiles, which come out of map, map box, uh, geo packages, which comes out of the OGC. So it's a, it's meant as a shape file replacement. Uh, the thing about shape files is every layer is, is three files, so seven layers, you're at, at least 21 files or more. GeoPackage, it's one file that can scale up to over a terabyte, and you can have it all in one file, and it supports both raster and vector. Also, GeoJSON is a very popular format on the web. Uh, follows sort of the well-known text style uh, of parsing, but it uses JavaScript object notation to do it. Uh, we can also consume OGC web services. So they do allow you to, uh, within Arc Pro and Arc Map Desktop, you know, bring in OGC mapping web services, mapping tiled web services, and also uh, web mapping feature services as well. Another thing that you might run into if you do a bit of geoprocessing, especially if you're using the JavaScript API, is something called a feature set. So uh, in a file geo database, you have a lot of Feature data sets, which is something different, just a folder of feature classes. And you, again, you have feature classes. But on the web, those get reduced down to a feature data set, a simplified version of a feature class. Okay, So you can bump into that when you're getting data out of a web map, uh, sending it to a geoprocessing service, and getting the result coming back to you. So it looks, it looks kind of close to a feature class, but it's not the same thing. Also notice down the bottom, we've got Arc Pro and the Arc Pro SDK. So we do have Arc Pro and it's built with an Arc Pro SDK. You can get the SDK. You yourself can, you know, with the right licensing, use the SDK to build uh, custom ribbons and extensions for Arc Pro. Down below, just to make, uh, just to show, uh, uh, well, make you aware of, uh, Flex, the Flex runtime and the Silver Write runtime. So part of the reason they could kill off the web ADF is they could build much better applications in Flex, uh, Flex Builder and Silverlight. But those require plugins in the browser. Okay, so Flex, Flash plugin, uh, Silverlight, the Silverlight plugin. And so there's a couple things that killed that. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs at Apple, uh, purposely not supporting Flash on the iPad. That was well known and publicized that Flash was not going to work. Also, uh, Chrome said they were going to stop supporting Netscape plugins and just go, solely go with HTML5 apps. So uh, Silverlight was built to be a Flash killer, but it, you know, uh, before it could kill Flash, that that whole concept of Netscape plugins and and running apps that way got killed off itself, and uh, people just started so focusing solely on HTML5, so JavaScript cascading style sheets and some tweaks to HTML, which we can uh, see above. And that, and that also leads that the web ADF, if you go down to the bottom uh, left-hand corner here, the web ADF was meant to build applications, but that application building has definitely changed today. That is definitely uh, a lot more going on in ArcGIS Online in the portal via Web App Builder. So if we're gonna build a web app today, I mean, the first stop would be looking at their built templates and then maybe customizing it with Web App Builder and just building it right uh, within the browser within ArcGIS Online. This gets us to this happy world and notice that we're really far away from the formats right now. And that. So in this little bubble, this little group, we have uh, ArcGIS Online in the portal with Web App Builder built into it. We also have the JavaScript runtimes at, three, at version three and four. Uh, when you're in Web App Builder, if you're building a 2D app, you use the three. And if you're building a 3D app, scenes published from Arc Pro, you're using the four version. Also note that um, in ArcGIS Online, uh, there are these things called maps and, these, and there are these other things called apps that have maps inside them. And inside the maps, there are feature services. Right, and we you know we collect a bunch of feature services to 
create a map. And then we use one or many maps to create an app. What's interesting is these can be resources or consumed by other applications, right? So if you already have a map published in ArcGIS Online, you can quickly drop it into an, an App Studio application. Or if you have an, exif an existing application such as a map tour storybook or story map, you can actually consume that in some of the App Studio templates and it will reorganize it so that it looks better on a mobile phone. Now, some interesting things that are going on uh, is that uh, all of these uh, App Studio uh, can make use of, uh, of a runtime, but there's all these other runtimes going on as well. Okay. So there's the Java runtime at version 100. There's the Android version at version 100. There's the iOS runtime at version 100. And there's the Mac OS runtime at version 100. There's also a .NET runtime at version 100. And .NET means Windows. And so they have all these different runtimes. And they basically do all the same thing. And they try as hard as they can to keep them all in sync. And then there's a very curious one on the bottom called Qt. The Qt runtime right, can actually uh, run on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. So it can hit uh, four of these runtimes directly, but the Java runtime exists so that you can build cross-platform apps that run on Mac, Windows, and Linux. But the thing is, is that Qt can do all of that as well. So they have one runtime, the Qt runtime, that can do actually all five of the ones above, the Java, the Android, the iOS, the Mac, and the .NET. Now, we've seen in the past they don't like having like uh, two Arc IMSs, right, the, or two Internet map servers. They collapse into one. They didn't like having uh, supporting the code base for Arc Map and Arc Catalog and one for Arc IMS. So they rewrote and created ArcGIS server based on that common library. And here we have... Uh, you know, six libraries where one, where actually one of the libraries can do all what the all, all five of the other ones can do. So just knowing the trends and way they work in the past, for me, it seems obvious that they could, if they wanted, and there must be pressure internally, right? Get rid of the Java, Android, iOS, Mac, and .NET and just focus on Qt. And then you can hit all those areas. And then it would just streamline. They, get, they have one at runtime to support, and they can get to all those uh, platforms. Now, they still might want to build natively for the for the uh, Android and Mac. But I can't uh, see the .NET, the iOS, and the Java sticking around. Uh, not in the long term, right? I haven't put a walker symbol on them yet, right? But if you step back and look, you go, well, that's a lot of runtimes you got to try to keep synced and together. Uh, and there's a lot of inertia because, oh, do I want to make this change because I'm going to have to update all these other ones. And you can move much faster if you just have one runtime to update. Um, and they still have the Java one too, right, uh, that they have, have to deal with. And so it's kind of interesting. Uh, and then App Studio solely uses the Qt runtime. And App Studio lets you get anywhere. You, when you build apps in App Studio, you can go to Windows, you can go to Mac, you can go to iOS, which is the iPhone and the iPad, and you go to Android, which is a lot of devices. Right, you can also go to Linux too in that. So there's uh, some interesting things uh, that I think will happen in this area here. And this is a lot of darker green box where there may be one winner in the end or not. There might be three, uh, but I definitely can see how the other ones might uh, over time sort of die off. Because we've seen the trend that uh, these types of libraries and products die off, right? In that and it is it is a lot of effort on their part to keep them all in sync and they've never traditionally liked doing that right no one wants to uh, support products forever um, and it's not always scalable because you have all those developers and you can just focus them on the one run time and make it really good in that so this is one to give you just uh sort of my thoughts and feelings on on how things have changed uh where we're kind of at which is this bubble that you see in front of you and even inside this bubble i can see things uh moving more moving around a bit more i definitely think that services are here to stay but they're in the background arc the arc just online and the portal are here to stay for a bit and app studio uh just to you know the stuff i've seen so far in it and the things i've seen with qml and Qt 
definitely feels like it's going to be around a while. It, sol it solves a lot of problems that we currently have uh, in that. And so, and the JavaScript runtime will keep rolling. I don't see, you know, the internet, the cloud, or web browsers disappearing overnight. Uh, but if you're working in this area and quite familiar with it, you know, uh, and you build your skills up here, it can be very valuable. So for now, this concludes this video.